Psalm 122, verse 1 says, I was glad when they said unto me, Let us come into the house of the Lord. Have you come to worship Him this morning? I said, have you come to worship Him this morning? I know I have. Welcome to camp meeting. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let's stand and let's worship the Lord as the Central Ensemble comes to lead us in worship today. God bless you this morning. Sing with us. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great. The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself. at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God age to age
praise the Lord this morning together. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Pastor Philip Pearson, lead pastor at Landmark Church of God in Statesville, North Carolina, has been serving in full-time ministry with the Church of God for over 29 years. During that time, he has spent 26 years as a lead pastor. Throughout his ministry, Pastor Pearson has served on state councils and state youth and discipleship boards. He has had the privilege of speaking at several camp meetings and prayer conferences. Pastor Pearson considers his greatest titles and privileges in life to be that he is a follower of Jesus Christ, Darla's husband, and Paul, Paige, Phil, and Peyton's dad. Please welcome to the Western North Carolina Church of God Camp Meeting Stage, Pastor Philip Pearson. Good morning and greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a privilege and honor to be here with you today, and I thank you so much for getting out of the bed, for opening your eyes, for splashing a little water on your face, for ingesting a little bit of coffee, and for being here so chipper this morning. I want to say a huge thank you. It is an honor to stand before you today, and I want to thank our administrative bishop, Dr. Ken Bell, for your confidence. For the honor of being here today, thank you. It's not an honor I take lightly, and I'm so appreciative of the invitation. I also want to extend a huge thank you to the pastor of this house, the bishop of this house, and his team, the AV and the media team, who are operating in a spirit of excellence, doing in everything they do incredibly well. So thank you. Would you let them know how much you appreciate them? And <laughs> Amen. As we stand together this morning, I want you to open your Bibles with me, and we're going to be looking at the book of 2 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Thessalonians today, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 together today. When Dr. Bell had asked me to speak this morning. God began to lay upon my heart this message, began to birth in my spirit a word that I believe is for the church, for pastors, for pastors wise, for us. We're better together, and I believe God is going to speak to us today. Beginning in verse 1, it says, therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone. And sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. I want to talk to you for the next few moments on the very simple thought, appointed for this. I believe with all of my heart that there is no such thing as luck, happenstance, or chance in the life of a child of God. Our steps are ordered by a sovereign God. And whatever is coming and going in our lives, whatever we are facing in this earth, we have been appointed to this by the God that we serve. Let's pray together this morning. Father, I love you today. Lord, I am so thankful for your great love. I'm thankful this morning for the opportunity that we have to gather together in this house. Father, I pray for the next few moments that you would hide me in the shadow of the cross, that God, you would anoint our hearts and our minds and our ears that we might receive the word of God with readiness and with gladness. Father, I pray that it would encourage, that it would strengthen, that it would build up your body and that we would leave this place differently than we came. Father, it's in the mighty and the wonderful, the holy name of Jesus that we pray together today. Amen and amen. God bless you this morning as you are being seated. 
came across a letter some time ago that might adequately describe what the church faced, what we faced in 2020. It was a letter written by a bricklayer. It begins as this, Dear Sir, I am writing in response to your request for additional information in block number three of the accident reporting form. I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. You asked for a fuller explanation and I trust the following details will be sufficient. I am a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I found I had some bricks left over, which when weighed later were found to weigh 240 pounds. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel by using a pulley which was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the bricks into it. Then I went down and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 240 pounds of bricks. You will note on the accident reporting form that my weight is listed as 135 pounds. Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward at an equally impressive speed. This explains the fractured fractured skull, minor abrasions, and the broken collarbone as listed in Section 3, Accident Reporting Form. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until the fingers of my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley, which I mentioned in paragraph 2 of this correspondence. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold the rope in spite of the excruciating pain I was now beginning to experience. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Now devoid of the weight of bricks, the barrel weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight as listed in Block 3 of Accident Reporting Form. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up. This accounts for two fractured ankles, broken tooth, and severe lacerations of my legs and lower body. Here, my luck began to change slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell into the pile of bricks, and fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. I am sorry to report, however, as I lay there on the pile of bricks in pain, unable to move and watching the empty barrel six stories above me, I again lost my composure and presence of mind and let go of the rope. The problem with 2020 is we've had a lot of people let go of the rope. Due to the pain and the circumstances and the situations that we have endured, we've had people let go of the rope of fellowship in the local church. Due to the hardships and the anxieties that we have incurred and that have transpired for us who name the name of Christ and who serve the kingdom of God, we've had a lot of pastors who have let go of the rope and walked away from their calling and their anointing. We've had pastor's wives get discouraged and have fled fellowship. We have lost marriages and ministries throughout this year because so many have let go of the rope. And perhaps that is where the context of Paul's message is so applicable for us in our day and time. Paul is writing to a church in Thessalonica that he loves dearly. In chapter 2, verse 17, to lay a context for what he would later write in chapter 3, he declares his sincerity of love for these people. It was a church he had founded, a church he had pastored, and so he tells them in verse 17 of chapter 2, you know I was, or I was torn away from you when I did not want to be. I was ripped from your presence. He had been chased out of town. And the word that he used there for torn away in the Greek literally means that he felt like he had orphaned them, that they were children to him. They were dear in his sight. And because of that, in verse 18, 
He says, I wanted to come to you time and time again to check on you and to make sure that you were okay as a congregation. But Satan hindered me. That word in the Greek, hindered, literally means that Satan broke the road up in front of him. He created detours and obstacles and even as much as Paul would have wanted to get back together with his congregation there at Thessalonica, somehow or another Satan prohibited that, fought so hard against it that it became an impossibility for Paul to do what he wanted to do, for Paul to do what he had been called to do. And therefore, in chapter 3, as he begins to write to them, he declares to them, when we couldn't stand it any longer, when we could not take it any longer, we felt it good to be left in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy just to check on you, to make sure that you have not been shaken by the afflictions that we have endured that you are going through. Again, in the Greek, that word shaken gives us the word picture of a dog shaking his head back and forth with something in its mouth. Paul says, you know what I've understood and what I've come to understand about this journey in life? If you don't have a sense of appointment, you cannot walk in your anointing and you cannot fulfill the call of God upon your life. For without a sense of anointing, it opens the door. And without a sense of appointment, it opens the door for temptation in your life, for discouragement in your life, and for the enemy to shake you back and forth like a dog would shake a chew toy. But what Paul declares to the church at Thessalonica is that because you are appointed and because you know that we are appointed for a time and for a season just like this, there is also an anointing that equips the appointing. There is an anointing that will give you strength and power and endurance and the ability to fulfill the call of God upon your life. Perhaps that is so applicable for us today because I don't know about you, I I faced 2020 and on into 2021 not having all the answers. Now maybe you do and if you do, you need to see me after the conclusion of this service because I want your secret and we'll write a book together and we'll both make a lot of money. I've not had all the answers. I've not always had a clear-cut path to move forward with the call of God upon my life in the circumstances that we have been in. As much as I wanted to do some things in 2020, it seemed like Satan fought every step along the way. It seems as if there has been a hellish attack unleashed upon the body of Christ. We have faced an unprecedented darkness that Dr. Culpepper referred to last night. It has seemingly overwhelmed us. It has discouraged many. We have faced the physical attacks of a virus that has run rampant throughout our land. We have lost loved ones. We still have people who are dealing with the long haul effects of this virus upon their bodies. I would tell you I suffered through this virus. I still can't smell a thing seven months later but there are others who are dealing with far greater repercussions and ramifications of this virus. There has been a physical toll that it has extracted upon the body of Christ. But there has also been other things that it has caused and that we have faced throughout this year. There have been societal pressures. There have been hot button topics like political topics, racial division, transgenderism, perversity running rampant throughout our society. There has been a venom and a vitriol that has engulfed us as a society that has even crept its way into the body of Christ where people don't get along anymore. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I need to let you know it's not just you. I know some folks like to make believe it's not their church, but it's every church. I don't know one church that has escaped 
the scathing attack of the enemy intact and unscathed throughout all of this. We have taken an emotional toll as we have battled depression and despondency and suicidal thoughts. There has been a spiritual toll that has stemmed from isolation and struggling churches and preachers. No doubt there are some of you in this place today that you have, that you have limped to the pulpit on a Sunday morning feeling the wounds that have been inflicted Monday through Saturday. You have felt the discouragement and the oppression of demonic entities and spiritual forces of wickedness that have aligned themselves against the body of Christ. I would guarantee you that on some Saturday nights you have wept before a God begging Him to let you out of the responsibility of declaring the goodness of God to a group of people the next morning. You have preached about faith to your congregation when yours was hanging by a thread. You have preached about hope when you didn't feel any in your spirit. You have gone through the motions, but I've got good news for you this morning. You're not alone in that. You are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. You are empowered by the God of heaven, and I've come by to let somebody know you have been appointed for this. It's not not by chance that you're here today. It's not by luck you're here today. You are a miracle in the hands of God that is unfolding in the divine providence of kingdom work. And you may not realize it, but this morning you're here because the God of heaven has intervened in your life and said no to the attack of the enemy. I'm telling you, some of you, the devil meant for you to be a casualty of this hellish assault of 2020. He meant for your marriage, your children, your witness, and your ministry to fall by the wayside and to be of no effect. But the God of heaven has declared in your life, in Philippians 1 and 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've got news for somebody with cancel culture raging. God is going to finish His work. With all of hell fighting you, God is still going to finish His work. Dealing with COVID and a society that calls us irrelevant, God is going to finish His work. Not just in this day, but moving forward until the Lord Himself Self descends from heaven with a shout and the voice of the I've got news for somebody your anointing is still intact your appointment is still intact you ought to lift up your eyes to the hills from which cometh your help your help still comes from the Lord oh somebody give him a praise in this house hallelujah but if you're going to operate with an appointment then you got to make some identification in life. I'm thankful for every administrative bishop who ever took a chance on me. This is going to sound political. I don't mean it to be so. But I'm going to tell you it bothers me when we've got people that our denomination has invested in, taken a chance on when you were a nobody from nowhere, and then you arrive at a certain place and you don't feel like you need our denomination anymore. I'm telling you, we need each other. We're better together. We're better together. I remember as a 23-year-old young man, I remember my pastor, Bishop Daniel Hampton, seeing something in me I didn't see in myself. I knew God had called me to preach when I was 14, and I ran from that calling just as fast and as firm as my feet would carry me. I wanted to be anything else but a preacher. I didn't want to submit. I did not want to give my life to the preaching of the gospel. I wanted to be a lawyer, and I had headed everything in my life in that direction. And yet somehow, some way, he as my pastor saw something in me and began to affirm the call of God upon my life. And on a Wednesday night, he entrusted me to preach in his pulpit with my first message. I'm going to tell you something. Bishop, looking back through the lens of hindsight, he had to be stark raving crazy. 
I don't understand it. I don't know why he did it. The only thing I can come up with is that he was crazy at that moment. Because looking back, I would have never entrusted myself with that pulpit. But he set me forth in ministry. They laid their hands on me. They affirmed the call of God upon my life. And somehow or another, I began this journey of ministry. And I'm thankful for every voice along the way, every person who's made an impact and sowed a seed into my life and made a deposit of eternal things in my life. And when I look back, I see every bishop who took a chance on me. Bishop Hampton, who appointed me to my first church in Arkansas, 1,500 miles away from where I grew up and out in the middle of a rice field where there were more mosquitoes than people. We were 45 miles from the closest McDonald's. Honey, let me tell you something. If you're 45 miles from a McDonald's, you are nigh unto the edge of the world. I had left a growing youth group in North Georgia and showed up and my wife and I got married and two weeks later we assumed this pastoral position. Our first service at that church, there were six brave folks that showed up, including me and my wife, and I looked to heaven and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he trusted me with a pulpit, and I'm indebted to that. I'm indebted to Bishop Bill Isaacs, who entrusted me with an appointment in Ohio. I'm indebted to Delbert Rose, who has gone on to be with the Lord, who entrusted me with an appointment in Georgia. I'm indebted to Dr. Ken Bell, who somehow, without knowing me from Adam's house cat, gave me an opportunity to interview and then become the pastor at Landmark. I don't know how any of these men ever took a chance on someone like me, but I am thankful for that every single day of my life. But here at, here's the, the gist of it. Here's where the rubber meets the road. If I operate every day of my life thinking that they were the ones who truly appointed me, I've missed it. Because if they are the ones who have appointed me, then my life is in their hands. My hope is in their hands. My future is in their hands. If I ever relegate the days of my life to the hands of an individual, then I start to say crazy stuff when I don't get a vote or he doesn't put me somewhere. Like that bishop doesn't like me. He kept me from going where God wanted me to go. Now let me just go ahead. He, he didn't pay me to say this, but on any pastoral appointment, he's got five preachers that look at him and tell him, I've heard from God. It's God's will that I go to this church. And then in the lunacy of our system sometimes, he makes an appointment making one person happy and offending four other guys, and then they get to vote on him in a couple of years. Crazy. Crazy. But if I relegate my life to that system and say that he is in control of all of that, then my life loses significance. I want you to understand there is only one person who, who relegates and who gives shape to your life and who ratifies the appointment of your life, and that's the God of heaven. you got to make this identification. Who is this God who appoints my seasons, who numbers my day, and who orders my steps? The psalmist would write in Psalm 19, verse 1, about this God. The heavens declare your glory, O God. When you look up, it's a testimony service on the greatness of the God that we serve. Do you realize that if you were to jump on board a light ray, a ray of light, and travel at 186,000 miles per second, in two seconds you would pass the moon that circles this earth, and you guessed it, God would be there to cheer you on your way as you pass the moon. In eight minutes you would pass the sun, and you guessed it again, the 
God of heaven would be there to wave at you when you went by. In four months, you would exit our solar system and it would be God who would open the door to let you through. In five years, you would come to the next closest star, Alpha Centauri, and you guessed it again, the God of heaven would be there as the creator of this universe. In 100,000 years, you would exit the Milky Way and the known universe that we have record of, and God would still be God right there at the edge of this universe. Preacher, why are you telling us this? I'm telling you this to give you a confidence in the one who holds your life in the palm of his hand. If he flung the stars into the sky, if he counts them and knows them by name, that God can still work together everything in your life for your good and his glory. It doesn't matter what a church council says. It doesn't matter what a church boss says. It doesn't matter matter what anybody else says the God of heaven has appointed you and because he's appointed you he's also anointed you Genesis chapter 15 we have record of an incredible story sorry if I come down here I need somebody brother Gunner would you help me preach for just a minute you're going to be Abraham come here Genesis 15 God, in the middle of a cold Mideastern night, wakes up an old man. Not that you're old. If I was going to get somebody old, I would have gotten Dr. Martin right behind you. This is purely circumstantial. He wakes him up and says, Abram, I need you to walk with me. Abraham throws on a shawl. And he exits the tent. God walks him out into the coolness of the night and begins to speak to him. Do you remember, son, my promises in your life? Do, do you remember that I told you I was going to make you the father of a nation? That I was going to make your descendants as numerous as the sands of the sea and the stars in the sky? So... Here's what I want you to do. Since your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars of the sky, I want you to look up and begin to count them for me if you can, Abraham. Abraham did exactly that. He begins to count what Abraham could not possibly have known. What science tells us today is that the stars that we have record of on record the stars that we know their coordinates and we know their location is 40 sextillion stars if Abraham had been able to count them at the rate of 60 per minute and move forward at that rate it would have taken him 2,000 years just to count the stars in the Milky Way you say God was giving him an impossible task oh no God was giving him a reality check God didn't expect him to count stars but what God did was get him out of his circumstance get him out of his situation and point him to the heavens and and say, son, if I flung them into the skies, if I know them by name, I'm big enough to handle any circumstance in your life. I've come by to remind somebody, it doesn't matter what the government says. It doesn't matter what a mandate says. It doesn't matter what a president says. There's a God who sits on the throne of this universe and still declares to his people, I have appointed you. The identification. But after you make an identification, there's some observations you need to know. Because you're not facing an enemy who's happy about your appointment. We are facing an enemy who creates hindrances to our appointments, to the work of God, and to what God has called us to do. As we begin to look at those hindrances, I would tell you that disappointment is one of the greatest hindrances to your appointment that you'll ever know. Disappointment 
can cause you to miss the season that God has reserved specifically for you and your ministry. I'm telling you, I believe if 2020 was about anything, it was about the enemy of our soul creating an atmosphere of disappointment that has overwhelmed and engulfed the body of Christ, that has robbed us of our joy, that has depleted us of our strength, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. I don't know how it happened for you. I don't know when it happened for you. March 8th last year, we were at a high water mark. That morning we took in over 30 new members. Had incredible church. God was moving in a great way. It was that morning after church and riding on the crest of a great move of God, my wife and I bailed out and went to go celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary. When you have kids, they go with you. It wasn't like it was a romantic getaway. We went to a cabin in Gatlinburg with four kids and a future daughter-in-law and two dogs. Wasn't quite like it was 25 years ago, but we had a great time. Until my youth pastor texted me on Saturday evening. Now, don't get upset at him. I'm so glad he did. Because at about 5.30 Saturday evening, he shot me a text and he said, did you see that? My response was, did I see what? He said, the news conference. I said, what news conference? I'm sitting on top of a mountain. I'm not paying attention to life. I'm enjoying family. Everything's going wonderful in our lives. We're eating at Paula Dean and getting fat. I'm getting fat. They're all staying skinny. And he sends me a link to the governor's press conference where at 5 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, the governor issues a mandate that churches cannot gather that next morning. You can only have 10 in any building or any room at a given time. And everything shuts down. I don't know about you. I lived by faith for about two weeks, three weeks, and then desperation set in. I'd exhausted every idea that I had, every cute thought I had, every program I had. I'd exhausted the extent of my knowledge in two to three weeks after that point, and I was in complete despair, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to turn. There was no book that was written about it. There wasn't a cute conference you could attend that would give you the answer. And here we are in the midst of a barren season. Barrenness is one of the most difficult times in life and ministry that you will ever go through. We were not meant to be barren. Seasons where there is no fruit are particularly exasperating for we who are serving the King of Kings. For He called us to bear fruit. Jesus said to His disciples, You have not chosen Me, but I chose you, that you might go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit might remain. Fruit is the proof of fulfilled purpose in life. Fruit looks different on every tree, but you can be sure of this. Fruit is the testimony of fulfilled purpose in the life of a child of God. And yet in that season, it was a season of barrenness. It was one of the most difficult seasons I've ever been through in my life. And yet God spoke to me in the midst of that and turned me all the way back to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And there you encounter a woman whose name is Hannah. And she is going through a season of barrenness in her life. Her main competition, a woman named Penina, who's living in the same house and vying for the affection of her husband, is fruitful and having babies everywhere you turn. And yet here is Hannah, so broken by her barrenness that she cries out to God at an altar and words will not come. And it's so bad that the priest mistakes her brokenness for drunkenness. You need to listen to me for a moment. I believe the season of 2020 
while not authored by God, was used by God to bring the church into a season of barrenness. You say, preacher, why would God ever bring a season of barrenness? Because in a season of barrenness, there are only two choices you can make. You can either embrace bitterness and you can grow hard and you can get upset and you can blame everybody else and you can look for a scapegoat. You can play the comparison game. Why is that church growing? Why are they seeing good things when my church is not? You can embrace that bitterness of spirit or you can allow it to drive you deeper into God and create a spirit of brokenness where the only answer you've got is to cry out to the God of heaven, give me a baby or else I die. You see, it's been a long time since the church has had a burden for babies like that. God help me preach. We have classified revival as when the Baptist church breaks out and they get hungry for the Holy Ghost and they come to our church for it. We like that because they already know how to tithe. They already know how to teach a Sunday school class. And if we can just get them full of the Holy Ghost, they make great members. We classify revival as when the assembly of God splits and all of a sudden we get a hundred new members and it looks great because we can report it to the state office and it looks like our church is really doing something. We have become so carnal that our hunger is for a statistic rather than for babies being born in the kingdom of God. I believe God has allowed this season of barrenness because He wants a church that is broken before Him that knows how to do nothing but cry out to the God of heaven for the salvation of souls in our community that will cry out to heaven until we see our altars filled with sons and daughters coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. You might as well get ready. This harvest isn't going to look like your harvest. My God in heaven. We've tried to clean the fish before we've ever caught the fish. We've tried to make it look like our generation. Let me tell you, this generation's not going to look like your generation. I don't know what you're experiencing at your church, but at my church, there are folks getting saved that look like they fell face first into a tackle box. There are folks getting saved that's got more tattoos than a cartoon comic strip. I mean, they've got ink everywhere. We've got people getting saved coming out of drug addiction. We've got people getting saved coming out of homosexuality. And what I've come to understand is babies are messy. You gotta change a few diapers. You gotta wake up at midnight sometimes. You gotta go the extra mile. But I'm telling you, babies are worth it. We gotta get our focus back on the harvest and cry out to God for the babies of this generation. And what I've noticed is if you'll make God's children important, God will make your children important. We've got sons and daughters of the kingdom who are living like the devil. We've got children who are PKs, who are lost and undone. And I'm telling you, I believe the God of heaven will honor the burden of your heart that if you get a burden for babies, God will make your babies important. Prior to COVID... I'd been down to visit my mother, my mother who is 84 years old, is probably watching online this morning if we're televising this, we're broadcasting this, this is on Facebook. Mom, I love you. If I didn't say that, she'd probably whip me the next time I saw her, so I'm wanting to avoid that. She's the longest surviving leukemia patient in the state of Georgia, 24 plus years ago. I was there in the room when the doctor walked in, Dr. Sarma, little Hindu man. He walked in and he told my mama, he said, you've got three to six months left to live. Get your affairs in order. I don't believe it's going to be six. It's going to be closer to three. You're the worst case of leukemia I've ever seen walk in to my office. Her blood count, white blood cell count, was over half a million at that point in time. The only reason we know that is because that's the highest number the machine would go up to. It would not register any higher than that. He had no idea how she had not had a stroke at that point in time. 
When you get delivered that kind of news, it will get your attention. We had prayer right there in the office. We placed her in God's hands. And I'm happy to report that she outlived the practice of her doctor. She saw her doctor retire, and that little Hindu man, when, he went, when she went to see him the last time, she said, I want you to know, Doc, I appreciate everything you've done for me. I appreciate all that you've helped me with, but you didn't keep me alive. The God of heaven kept me alive. This little Hindu man looked at her and said, Sister, I believe you're right. I believe there's something to that. I was visiting her. I was coming back home and it had gotten late on that particular night it was around midnight and I got to Gaffney South Carolina exit 90 and I said dear Lord if I don't have a cup of coffee I'll never make it the rest of the way and I pulled off and went into that QT right there on exit 90 and went in and got me a cup of coffee as I got my cup of coffee I went up to pay for it and this young man got in line behind me smelled like a brewery Eyes bloodshot, looked like he had been on a three-day bender, and you could just smell alcohol, I mean, it reeked. And the only thought that went through my mind at that moment was, please, God, don't let him throw up on me. That is super spiritual, isn't it? It was 12 o'clock at night, I wasn't feeling super spiritual. I paid for my coffee, I walked outside, I got halfway to my truck, and I said, I didn't have to use the bathroom two minutes ago, but now I do. I had to go back inside and go to the restroom. Went to the restroom, came back outside, fussing and grumbling every step along the way. All I wanted was to get home and get in my bed. And as I walked through the door outside, I saw this young man sitting in his car with his feet in the parking lot, hanging over his head like this. And I thought to myself, he's going to hurl right there in the parking lot. And my only thought was, God, don't let me make eye contact with him. I don't want to see that. And so you know how we do when we're super spiritual sometimes. We're kind of like the Pharisee with the... We put our eyes down. We don't like to see those who have been beaten by life. We put our eyes down. We go on about our way because we've got far more important religious things to do. I got halfway to my truck and the Holy Spirit stopped me. I don't know how the Holy Spirit speaks to you. He speaks to me like this. He said, Pearson, go back and talk to that young man. I said, God, I don't want to go talk to that man. If I go back there, he's liable to throw up on me. I don't want to get thrown up on. It's midnight. I want to go home and go to bed. He slaps me in the back of my neck because the Holy Spirit does me like that sometimes. And he said, Pearson, I told you to go back and speak to that young man. And if you don't go speak to that man, you're going to be in direct disobedience to me. Being super spiritual, I turned around and fussed and grumbled every step along the way back to that young man's car. When I got there, I said, young man, you don't know me, but I'm a church of God preacher. And I don't want you to think I'm crazy. I don't want you to think I've lost my mind. But the Holy Spirit told me to come right back over here and talk to you. Is there anything I can do for you? Can I help you in any way? He looked at me and through tears streaming down, blood stained eyes. He said, don't you tell me that. He said, don't you tell me the Holy Spirit told you to come over here. I said, well, son, all I know to tell you is the Holy Spirit told me to come over here. I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to get into a fight with you. But the Holy Spirit told me to come over here and talk to you. He said, don't you tell me that. My mama and daddy were Baptist preachers. I grew up in a parsonage. And as I began to listen to him unpack his story, he had gotten so hurt over the way the church had treated his mama and daddy. That he backslid and he had been living as a functional alcoholic for three years. I said, son, where do your mama and daddy live? He said, I don't know. I haven't talked to them in two years. I know I'm a disappointment to them. I know that they won't love me anymore. I know after what I've done with my life, they'll never have me back again. I said, son, I don't know your mama and daddy. 
but I do know the God of heaven and I do know my relationship with my kids and I'll tell you this, the greatest phone call that could ever be made to me is one letting me know my kids were okay and safe. I said, son, can I call your mom and daddy for you? He handed me his phone, dialed the number. I've listened until there was somebody who answered on the other end. I expected somebody who was half asleep. But there was a female voice who spoke on the other end and it was clear as a bell. I said, ma'am, you don't know me, but I'm standing here in the parking lot of a QT gas station with your son. And I just want you to know he's okay. He's all right. I'm a church of God preacher. I just want you to know I stopped to have prayer with him and your son is okay. That little Southern Baptist woman let out the best Holy Ghost shout you've ever heard in your life. She said, I've been up for three hours calling his name in prayer, asking God to send somebody to talk to my baby boy. I've got news for you. If you make babies important, God will make your babies important. I sense something in my spirit. I sense coming out of this pandemic, coming out of this major catastrophe, coming out of this time where the world's been turned upside down, that we're entering a season of divine favor when the prodigal's going to come home, when the lost son and daughter is going to hit the... I've got news for you. You pray one more time. You intercede one more time. You fast one more meal. God of heaven is going to make your babies important. Secondly, not only disappointments, distractions. You may not shout with me on this one. You may not amen me real loud on this one. But in 2020, we had preachers that turned into everything but preachers. Watch Facebook as preachers became virologists overnight. Don't know where they got their degree, but all of a sudden they knew everything there was to know about virology. We had preachers that turned into immunologists overnight. And all of a sudden they knew everything in the world there was to know about immunology. We had preachers who turned into political commentators overnight. And all of a sudden they had every answer for every political issue that the world has ever faced. If you could just let them be in charge, the world would be perfect. And we forsook the one thing that God has appointed us and anointed us to actually do. And we wonder why we lost our moral compass, why we struggled throughout that year, why we saw barren altars, why we no longer saw the effectiveness that we used to see. I would submit to you because we have not been anointed to do any of those things. God did not anoint you to be an immunologist. God did not anoint you to be a virologist. God did not anoint you to be a commentator on the political scene. What did God anoint you to do? The answer is found in John 4, 18. As Jesus declared in the temple, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to preach the good news. I've got news for the church. It's time for us to get out of the woke business. It's time for us to get out of the politically cool business. It's time for us to get back on the wall, just like Nehemiah, and declare the work is too important for me to come down. Don't get drawn into a lesser calling that you are not anointed for. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 6 is facing much of what we have faced. He's facing an enemy that's trying to entice him into arguments that are not profitable. Just because somebody says something stupid on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram does not mean you have to respond. Doesn't mean you have to respond. Sometimes you need to bite your tongue until it bleeds or until the Holy Spirit gets you under conviction before you respond to some of the nonsense out there. Stay on the wall. 
If the enemy can get you off of your wall, he will draw you out from the place of your security. He will destroy and defame your character. He will distract you from true obedience to the Father in heaven. I'm telling you, you've got to stay on your wall. There are consequences when you abandon the wall and come down. You abandon the work at the most critical juncture of human history. You abandon the right way to pursue a man made way. You abandon your witness instead of walking in holiness because God has called you to walk in holiness. I've come by to let somebody know today it's okay to stay on the wall. It's okay to have a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. You build a little while and you fight the battle, but stay on the wall. Don't come down. Don't abandon the work. Don't allow your witness to be compromised. Distractions, last hindrance, I believe, is demonic whispers. We've had disappointment, distractions, but I would tell you 2020 was replete with demonic whispers. The voice of the enemy ringing in our ears constantly, making us question our call question our effectiveness, question our appointment, question what God has called us to do, question the direction of the church, question everything about what the, the ministry that God has entrusted into our hands. Demonic whispers that are initiated from hell itself. We have whispers that seek to intimidate, to make us feel overwhelmed and inconsequential in light of all that is going on. Reminds me of what Jeremiah faced in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. God speaks to Jeremiah and says, Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. That's a pretty good affirmation right there, if you ask me. God spoke to him and affirmed the calling and the appointment upon his life. And yet Jeremiah's response to that was, Oh God, when I see their faces... I cannot. You see, sometimes the whisper in your ear is predicated by the look and the direction you give your attention to. Notice Jeremiah didn't say anything about their words at first. He said, when I saw their faces, I thought I knew what they were thinking. And because I thought I knew what they were thinking, I could not open my mouth to declare what thus saith the Lord. I'm telling you, the enemy of your soul is seeking to intimidate you, to get you into a place where you operate in fear instead of faith. But I've got news for you. The same God who anointed Jeremiah as a prophet to the nations has appointed you to the position that you are in you need to walk back into that pulpit this coming Sunday square your shoulders like a t-rail and speak what thus saith the Lord without fear and without favor for if God be for you who can be against you it's not hard this is not rocket science God speaks to Jeremiah and he takes him to prophecy 101 and he says, Jeremiah, the call upon your life and your appointment is really easy. Here's what it boils down to. Jeremiah, I will show it. You will see it. If you will say it, I will succeed it. Not rocket science. Jeremiah, I'll show it. If you'll see it and you'll be obedient to say it, then I will make sure I succeed it. I'll make sure it happens. You know what? The same God is still on the throne. And God is not a man that he should lie. You are not entrusted with the success of your church. You are not entrusted with the success of your ministry. God has not called you to be a performing person and to do simply something in the light of trying to make it work. God has called you to walk in obedience. It doesn't matter if you're preaching to five people or 5,000 people. You preach the word of God. 
God. It doesn't matter if your pulpit is huge or if your pulpit is somewhere in the backwoods in North Carolina. I've come by to let you know, you just be faithful. You see it, you say it, and the God of heaven will make sure it comes to pass. Rejection, not only intimidation, but rejection. I'm going to tell you, the enemy of your soul knows how you're wired. And he seeks to create atmospheres of rejection that inhibit us from walking in the authority that God has called us to walk in. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how many sheep you've got. I've never found a way for it not to hurt when a sheep leaves the fold. Any pastor worth their salt better feel it personally when people walk away. It's not that you're to blame for it, but you feel it. And we take it personally. And it stings and it hurts. And if you listen to the whispers of the enemy of your soul, you will internalize that and you'll begin to blame yourself and you'll feel that rejection on a personal level. When it wasn't about you at all. This isn't your kingdom. This is the kingdom of God. They're not rejecting you. They're walking away from fellowship with Him. And sometimes the best thing you can do is to release them with your blessing and quit chasing uh, rebelliousness. There is a place to seek after the one that left the ninety-nine. There is a place to go after those who have fallen into temptation. There is a place to go after those who are struggling with their faith. But if you chase rebellion, you'll empower rebellion. And it'll work to the, to the demise of your ministry. You have to convince yourself to be able to release some people who are walking in rebellion without internalizing it. 2020 was a crash course in that. I had people that disengaged from fellowship that I never thought would. I had people who have left the church that I never thought would ever leave the church. I've had people disengage from fellowship for unknown reasons. Some started out as protecting their health. Some started out as not wanting to be around a crowd. But it is far more prevalent than that. It's not just about health. This is a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual attack against the body of Christ seeking to create isolation within the body and peel us away from fellowship with the saints of God. You need to hear me. I'm reminded of Amos chapter 7. Amos comes in from the hill country of Tekoa. God speaks a word to him. This is the first recorded message. And how would you like for this to be your first message? Jeroboam, you're going to die. The kingdom's going to be invaded. I don't know about you. I wouldn't like for that to be my first message. I'm so glad God let me preach John 3.16 for my first message. Here's Amos, a fig picker, a sheep breeder. No credentials. No family lineage, doesn't come from a group of preachers, doesn't have any heritage in the church. And God births a word in his spirit and he comes to town to preach this word. And Amaziah hears this word, goes and squeals to Jeroboam about this word. Jeroboam sends him back with a word for Amaziah, I mean for a word for Amos. And Amaziah shows up and says, go, you seal. We don't need your kind of Go back to the hill country, you hillbilly. We don't need your kind around here. A demonic whisper that invalidates the call of God upon the life of a prophet. A demonic whisper sent to reject and create the painful consequences of rejecting the message of God. But Amos has enough in him that he looks at Amaziah and he says, Honey, you didn't hire me. You cannot fire me. I'm on a mission from God himself with a word straight from the courts of heaven. Why is this so meaningful? Maybe it's not to you, but I relate to Amos. 
I wish, you, you know, Bishop, I, I show up at camp meeting, I hear all these preachers uh, have these wonderful testimonies about their daddy was a preacher and their granddaddy was a preacher and their fifth generation church of God and their ninth degree black belt Christians who have been trained in the art of Christianity. And there's part of me that gets jealous about that because I wish I had that testimony. I wish I had that heritage. I wish I had that legacy. But that's not my story at all. I've got a story of a broken family. i got a story of a dad who walked away. i got a story of a granddad who was the biggest bootlegger in Franklin County, Georgia, who ran more moonshine than you could shake a stick at, who spent seven years in federal penitentiary because he killed a man over a card game one night, who was a famous womanizer, a drunk, and who really lived a riotous life. I'm thankful God saved him two weeks from his death on his deathbed and he's in heaven in eternity in the presence of God today. But that's my heritage. That's my legacy. You know what? If I was God, I would have never looked for somebody like me. If I was God, I wouldn't have been the first round draft pick. Matter of fact, I probably would have been an undrafted free agent somewhere down the line because if I was God, I would have never looked look for somebody like me and maybe you're one of those that God would have never looked like somebody like you if you had the choice but thanks be unto God he didn't look at you through the lens of your demographics and he didn't look at you through the lens of your legacy and he didn't look through you through the lens of your heritage and he didn't look at you through the lens of your family lineage he looked down through the eternality of God and he said there's a man there's a woman I can use if I can just fill him with my spirit and appoint them to the position I've destined them for your callings of God I'm thankful for the affirmation of my denomination but my calling is of God I'm thankful for the affirmation of credentials I prize them I I cherish them I'm thankful to be church of God but I am thankful that the God of heaven looked down at my life and he may have had to reach into a horrible pit and into the miry clay but somehow or another he lifted me up and he planted my feet upon a solid rock and he established my goings and my comings and he gave me a new song to sing in the midnight hour Friend, it doesn't matter who rejects you as long as God affirms you. We've got to quit seeking man's approval and start living for an audience of one. Did you hear me? Start living for an audience of one. If you gain and garner God's approval, it doesn't matter whose disapproval you incur. Last thing. The affirmation of where our authority comes from. If you're going to survive in this climate, and in this culture, you better have more authority than what Cleveland, Tennessee can give you. You better have more authority than what an office in Charlotte can give you. Bishop, I'm thankful for your backing. You've made the statement to me more than one time. If you stay within the minutes and the law, I'll stand with you every step along the way. I appreciate an overseer that will do that. I'm thankful for his backing. But ultimately, my authority cannot come from him. My authority must be rooted and grounded in a much higher source. In order to validate it and give it authority in this world today, let me just go ahead and tell you, your authority doesn't come from a degree on a wall. I'm a believer and a proponent of education. You need to get everything you can get you need to get all of the educate. You need to apply yourself. You need to study to show yourself a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Take advantage of every opportunity you've got online, in person, doesn't matter. Hey, if you can get it, you need to get it. But that's not where your authority comes from. I've met, more pe I've met people who have more degrees than a thermometer, and all they are are educated fools. You see, we've lost something in our day and time. We've lost an unction. We've lost an anointing. We've lost a presence. We've lost the move of God that gives authority to what we do in the kingdom. When Paul showed up, he said, I do not come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I come to you in demonstration and power in the Holy Ghost. It is that authority and power that he operated in that gave credence to the ministry that he carried out. 
When are we going to realize that God has raised the church of God up to a peculiar place of ministry? He did not raise us up to be anybody else. He didn't raise us up to be non-denominational. He did not raise us up to be Baptist. He did not raise us up to be Methodist. He raised us up to be Pentecostal firebrands in this world, operating in the Spirit of God and with a fresh anointing on a daily basis. Enter Moses, Exodus chapter 3. Moses has spent 40 years on the backside of a desert. Moses' life can be split up into three different categories. The first 40 years of his life, he lived thinking he was somebody. The next 40 years of his life, he lived thinking he was a nobody. And the last 40 years of his life, he spent learning what God could do with a nobody. And after... 80 years of frustration and 80 years of foiled plans and 80 years of not seeing the fulfillment of God's will for his life. He has an encounter with God that changes everything. He's living in his father-in-law's house at 80 years of age, sponging off of him. And you thought your son-in-law was a loser. And yet here on the backside of a desert, he encounters a burning bush and he hears a voice speak to him out of that bush saying, Moses, take the sandals off your feet. The ground you're standing on is holy. Come over here. I need to have a word with you, son. He approaches the bush and there at the ripe age of 80 years old, God reconfirms the call of God upon his life and the appointment of his life that had been there laying dormant for 80 years. Sometimes it's not the fact that the enemy's won. Sometimes it's the fact that it's not the appointed season yet. Don't you allow the enemy of your soul to frustrate you because you haven't seen the fulfillment of the promise yet. Sometimes it's just not the right season. Sometimes you need to hold on a little bit longer. Sometimes you need to stand on the promise another season of your life and another little bit of your life until you see God fulfill it. God speaks to Moses. He says, son, I've got a word for you. When you stand before Pharaoh, when you go to fulfill my will, you tell them, let my people go. Moses begins to raise up every objection you can think of. I can't speak properly. I'm too old. I failed before. My face is on the post office wall back there in Egypt. Don't you remember, God? The last time I tried this, the last time I tried to do your will for my life, I made a mess of things. The last time I attempted to do something great for God, I ruined the whole thing by interjecting myself. I've got news for somebody. This ain't in my notes, but you need to hear me. Your failure wasn't final you're not big enough to destroy God's destiny for your life you're not big enough to destroy God's plan for your life you just give it a little while longer faithful is he who began a good work in you who will complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ so Moses stands there and God says Moses I gotta have you do something for me cast down your rod because from your birth till now, it's been the rod of Moses. And it's taken you as far as it can take you. It won't take you to the next season of your life. The anointing you've been operating in, what you've had, it was good enough for this season. But it can't take you to the next season. So Moses, throw it down. Moses throws it down, it becomes a snake. God had to get the humanity out of the vessel before it could be used for the purpose. Moses, if I can get the snake out of your rod, if I can get you out of the way, you can pick it back up and it'll no longer be the rod of Moses, it'll be the rod of God. Because when you stand before Pharaoh, the rod of Moses won't be good enough. 
When you stand before Pharaoh, the program you used to do won't be good enough. When you stand before a society that hates your guts, despises your ministry, what you used to do won't be good enough. Three, three points in a poem isn't going to cut it anymore. The same worship ain't going to cut it anymore. You're going to have to have a new anointing, a fresh touch to do the new work that I'm calling you to. You see, I'm just crazy enough to believe that if we have been appointed to this season, we've never been here before. We are in uncharted waters. I've never walked this direction before. I've never sailed these seas before. For. I don't have the answers for any of these problems right now that we're going through but the God of heaven this is not unprecedented for him and if I can just lay down what I used to do and pick up what he wants me to do I can operate in a fresh anointing and a fresh calling upon my life to do the work of ministry and if there's anything God spoke to me it's this some of you are going to leave this camp meeting refreshed, recharged, and revived, and you're going to walk back into the appointment that God has for you. Don't leave your season too soon. Don't allow frustration, rejection. Don't allow what the enemy's doing to chase you away from the place God has appointed you to. If you can hang on for another season, if you can hold on for another moment, if you can just lay it down and pick it back up again, I promise you there's a fresh anointing for this season right now. I want you to stand with me all over this place. I'm right at closing time, Bishop. I want to pray for us. Yande Mosho Kusa. I want you to reach over and lay your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you right now. You may not realize that that person standing next to you might be a miracle right now. You see, it's only by the providence of God they made it to this meeting. It's only by the providence of God that they're here today. The enemies fought them and they almost gave up, but God sustained them. Today they've come to a camp meeting desperate for a fresh word desperate for a fresh touch. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every pastor, every pastor's wife, every worship leader, every lay person who is in this building today. I pray for every teacher. God, we're desperate for you. God, we've been in a season of brokenness, but we refuse to embrace bitterness. We've been in a season of barrenness, but we refuse to grow bitter in it. We're going to be broken before you, and we're going to cry out to heaven until we hear from heaven. God, there's babies that need to be born into the kingdom. There's sons and daughters that need to come home. There's communities that need to be revitalized. There's revival that needs to happen. There's a fresh move of God ready to be embraced. And we present ourselves here today as candidates for all of that. God, if you've ever used us, use us again. If you've ever visited our churches with a move of God, do it again, oh God. If we've ever seen signs and wonders accompany the preaching of the gospel, do it again, oh God. I pray for every pastor, every pastor's wife. Bind them together, God. Rebuke every attack of the enemy that would destroy their marriage. Raise them up, God, in power and authority to impact their community and their church. God, I'm praying right now. Breathe on us fresh and new this morning. Don't leave us like you found us, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you. We give you glory and praise and honor today. In the strong name of Jesus, we call it done. And amen. And amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure. Tried and true
you enjoy the message this morning? What a powerful yes. Give him a hand. Outstanding job, Brother Pearson. You could tell he's been to his closet and he heard from God this morning. Another message for Western North Carolina ministers. It's one of those messages I wish all of our ministers could have heard. So you, if you enjoyed it, you tell your brother that didn't make it this morning. Uh, I was questioning when we started whether we need to have the 9 o'clock service, but you came in, <laughs> came in behind me. Appreciate you coming this morning. You know, it was the third hour of the day that the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. Third hour of the day would be 9 o'clock in the morning. So. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming. We're going to take a break, about 10 minutes. We'll be back for the Bible study with Dr. Livingston. God bless you.